you clicked on Movie Monkey Channel. Listen, as I explain a disaster drama thriller story from 1976 called Cassandra Crossing. Spoilers may come along as I explain. Have a good day. Forty years before a fearful train of zombies had made its blockbuster run to Busan, this train I'm talking about met a similar unfortunate disaster. A train dubbed as Transcontinental Express is scheduled to depart Geneva at 9.22 a.m. Its destinations are Basel, Paris, Bruxelles, Amsterdam, Copenhagen and finally Stockholm. An hour before the departure, passengers intending to ride started to arrive at the terminal. Among the passengers are Jonathan Chamberlain, a famous neurologist, his ex-wife Jennifer Rispoli Chamberlain, a former inmate of Yanov and Holocaust survivor turned watch salesman Herman Kaplan, Max the conductor, an elderly nun who likes romance novels, the hippie couple and their fellow bandmates, and Nicole Dressier, the wife of a German arms dealer. She is embroiled in an affair with her gigolo companion, a much younger man and mountain climber named Robbie Navarro. Navarro is secretly a heroin trafficker being pursued by Interpol agent Haley, who is traveling undercover as a priest. Haley is desperate not to have his cover blown, unfortunately for him, he shares a car with a spoiled little schoolgirl named Katerina, who suspects him immediately of not really being a priest when she sees an anchor tattoo on his arm from a previous Navy career. The train departs 9.22 am on the dock. Among the passengers worth mentioning is a stowaway Swedish passenger named Eklund. He is in the baggage area as he has no ticket for the ride. This morning, he's been in a shootout that happened in the International Health Organization Health Facility. They faked an emergency response using an ambulance which allowed them passage through security. However, when they reach highly secured area, the guard stopped them. The patient lying on the gurney pulled a gun with suppressor, then shoots the guard. They walked past the fallen guard. But, the guard was able to shoot back after pretending dead which kills one of the guys. Eklund and the other guy set up a bomb on the hallways. The wounded guard was able to push an alarm button that alerted two other guards. Shooting ensues as Eklund and his buddy pulls their own gun. To enter a secured room they shoot the door locks. But, upon entry, the guard shoots at them wounding Eklund's friend. Some bullet break a glass container that splashed this unknown liquid to their bodies. Eklund managed to flee on a glass window he breaks using a metal stool. It turns out, the liquid that splashed on their bodies is a pneumonic plague without antidote that is about to be destroyed by the US mission. Eklund's friend who has been shot by the guard is still in the facility being taken care of after contracting the plague from the liquid. Mackenzie, a U.S. Army intelligence officer arrives in the facility taking in charge over the incident. He asks the help of Dr. Stradler who knows about the plagues. Mackenzie at first assumes that nobody escaped from the shootout. Apparently, the two guards did not report the escape incident part. But upon further questioning the bedridden terrorist, they found out that he has friend who is out there in the open spreading the plague. Mackenzie immediately orders a search for plane passengers and hospitals in Geneva which turns out negative, leaving him suspecting that the Intercontinental Express is carrying the suspect when they found a used train ticket from the patient's belongings. The ticket shows that the terrorist rode from Stockholm to Geneva. Dr. Stradler says the only way is to immediately remove the suspect from the train and isolate him. But, Mackenzie correctly assumes that the suspect could have mingled with the train passengers thereby spreading the disease already. Dr. Stradler says they could simply stop the train and remove the infected passenger. Mackenzie answers that any country in Europe would not allow such move. Instead, Mackenzie decides to reroute the train to a disused railway line which goes to a former Nazi concentration camp in Yanov, Poland, where the passengers will be quarantined for 21 days. Probably, it would be better that nobody on the train knows what's happening, however, Dr. Chamberlain's ex-wife happens to peek on the window and realize that they already pass by Basel, one of the train's supposed stop. Worse, she saw police cars along the railways. She quickly went to his ex-husband, Dr. Chamberlain, to inform him. As she speaks with him, the train conductor approaches Dr. Chamberlain to inform him about a radio call from Colonel Mackenzie. The man on the other line discloses the presence of a plague carrier aboard the train which they fears is already dead. However, Dr. Chamberlain assures them that the person they're looking for is still alive. It appears, Eklund's friend in Geneva facility already died. In few minutes, the helicopter sent by Colonel Mackenzie reports visual contact of the train. Dr. Chamberlain, his ex-wife and the train conductor started looking for the plague carrier. In one first-class cabin, one of the passenger tells the doctor about a sweaty pervert. Dr. Chamberlain immediately knows where to find Eklund, the baggage car. On the way to the baggage car, he asked Mr. Kaplan if he knows Swedish to which the old man reply in affirmative. He asked Mr. Kaplan to come with them. They found Eklund very weak, sweating and some wounds are showing in his face and arms. The doctor instructed his ex-wife and the conductor to find anything that would indicate a probable contamination among the passengers while Mr. Kaplan tries to speak with the plague carrier. Mackenzie instructed Chamberlain to get the sick man to the helicopter hovering above the train. 
They tried to get the man to the basket hanging from the helicopter, but the sheer weight of the bloated man prevented them from doing so. Instead, the conductor put the sick dog on the basket. The sick dog was secured in the helicopter. Twelve miles ahead, there was a tunnel beneath a mountain. The helicopter stopped trying to lift the sick man as the train enters the tunnel. The sick man gone into coma. Chamberlain infers about the characteristics of the plague. Dr. Stradler informs him that the plague has no cure at the moment, spreads by airborne droplets, has 60% infection rate, and has initial symptoms like the common cold, sinus irritation and sore throat. Chamberlain asks Mackenzie for supplies and other provisions to contain the plague. Mackenzie further told Chamberlain that the train will be sealed once it arrives in Nuremberg and that he's planning to tell the passengers a different story to avoid panic from the passengers. The passengers now start showing some symptoms. Meanwhile, Dr. Stratner insists to bring the dog back to Geneva Health Facility to observe the dog and to further study the disease. Using the radio of the train, Mackenzie's voice is heard on the paging system informing the passengers that the train will be rerouted because the French railways notified them of a bomb threat on the railway lines. This started a ruckus. Some passengers wants to get off the train. Some had heated argument with the train's conductor. Previous argumentative conversation between Dr. Chamberlain and his ex-wife gradually turns to obvious concern for each other and amorous sometimes. Some passengers who showed some symptoms earlier started worsening. Some are chilling and sweating and feeling extreme thirst. The baby cries from discomfort. Katerina, the little lady is weak. The woman vocalist is chilling badly. Dr. Chamberlain had one train carriage vacated to serve as temporary quarantine area. One by one, they bring the sick passengers to the designated car. Dr. Chamberlain tells a different diagnosis to prevent panic. He tells one patient that it was food poisoning which some passenger does not believe at all. The train arrives at Nuremberg at night. Men in white suit with guns sealed the windows and entrances. This time, the passengers sensed something is not normal. An announcement through a loudspeaker confirms that the passengers had been exposed to a highly contagious disease and that they will be transported to a quarantine site in Yanov, Poland. The trauma of being brought back again to his previous prison during the World War led Mr. Kaplan to try to escape. He found an escape opening on the floor but when he is out, he is shot in the arms, then brought back to the train. Matches and lighters and other appliances that produces sparks or fire are seized by the authorities including the expensive watches being sold by Mr. Kaplan. But what hurt him most is going back to Yanov where he was once held prisoner of war. And he is worried about the bridge called Cassandra crossing because he thought it was an existent anymore. As the train is being sealed off a woman had gone coma and dies before Chamberlain gets his attention. Two sealed coffin are immediately brought inside to contain the cadavers. A large oxygen tank was installed inside the train for the passengers breathing in the sealed train. A nun dies from the plague few minutes after leaving Nuremberg. After speaking with Max and Mr. Kaplan, Jennifer, knew that passing on the bridge might not be safe, because long time ago people living underneath left for fear it will collapse. Now, it's the same bridge they are about to cross. Mr. Kaplan also reveals that his family died there in Yanov. Dr. Chamberlain reports to Mackenzie that there are only 61 cases with two fatalities and cases are confined only to first-class section of the train. Chamberlain further convinces Mackenzie to uncouple the train and leave the rest that are uninfected to quarantine somewhere. But Mackenzie is adamant and firm in his decision to bring all the passengers to Yanov. At this point, Dr. Stradner interferes to the conversation to inform Mackenzie that the dog recovers from the disease. Finally, Dr. Chamberlain tells Mackenzie that Cassandra Crossing is not safe. Mackenzie replies that the bridge was tested by computers and in personal inspection and that the government of Poland spent money to have it rebuilt to which Dr. Chamberlain does not believe. He's more convinced that Mackenzie is a liar. The priest finally blows his cover to apprehend the drug dealer but Robbie Navarro was able to fight and took his gun. He took his mistress hostage, disarmed some military in white. He wants the train stop to which the military did not obey him. Robbie fires a warning shot that destroys the radio. Dr. Mackenzie interferes in the commotion. He challenged Robbie to kill them all and reveals that all he need is heroin. It's clear now why the doctor deferred administering him previously an injection because the doctor saw indication of needle injections of heroin in his arms. It ended up Robbie giving up his gun. Then, on the door there was the couple from the band revealing that the lady already recovered from the disease. Other patients on the train show signs of recovery. The dog brought back to Geneva also showed signs of steadily improving health. Dr. Stradler finally realized that oxygen caused the recovery of the dog. Then tells Mackenzie the reason why only two persons died in the train is because of the train was also oxygenated. Dr. Stradler calls the train to inform Dr. Chamberlain about the good news. At this moment we know it's not possible because Robbie the drug dealer riddled the radio with bullets. Dr. Chamberlain already knows about the recovery of the patients. 
Now he's trying to convince Captain Scott, the officer in charge, to at least delay the train for an hour so he could have enough time to make an examination to assess all the passengers. His concern is about the safety of the bridge that they are about to cross. Dr. Chamberlain was thrown out of the radio control carriage when he tried to pick up the telephone to tell the train operator to stop the train. In desperation, Dr. Chamberlain gathers some men to help him take over the train. He first recruited Robbie, then the agent discussing his priest, the couple from the band and others. One by one, they disarmed the military and got hold of their guns. Then they asked everybody in the first class to evacuate to second class carriage. Mr. Kaplan seemed to have surrendered himself to fate. He stayed on the second class for no apparent reason. Dr. Chamberlain's idea is for Robbie the drug dealer mountain climber to climb the roof and get to the train operator to stop the train. Gun battle started between the military and the Dr. Chamberlain's men. Robbie did not succeed on the roof. He tried climbing on the metal slats welded on the train windows toward the train operator in the front. Robbie proved to be expert climber, but one military man spotted him on the window and shooted him then he fell to his death. Jennifer soaked a rope in a flammable liquid then attached it to the propane gas tank used in the kitchen. After opening the gas valve she rushed out the carriage then Dr. Chamberlain lit the rope with the remaining match stick. But, the fire died on the carpeted floor. The military used tear gas canister to stop them from fighting. Wait, it suddenly came to me, I have to remind you that this is Movie Monkey Channel. The choice is yours to hit this one, and this, and that one there so notations will appear on your device. Now, going back to the story. In a heroic deed, Mr. Kaplan slowly walks the kitchen while the inspector Haley, the one who disguised as priest was shot while saving Katerina. Mr. Kaplan lights his lighter on the kitchen sparking into explosion prying open the carriage floor, also killing him in the process. Dr. Chamberlain now detaches the rest of the train from the second class carriages to the front. The conductor operates the brake to stop the rest of the train while the detached train front continues running over the Cassandra crossing. The steel bridge collapses before the front of the train reaches the middle. The carriages fell one by one to the base of the support of the bridge making stronger impact killing all the passengers. The story ends here. The passengers of remaining portion of the train survives if not for heroic persons aboard the train. Meanwhile, Mackenzie reports that there has been an accident and in that there are no survivors from the incident thinking that the oxygen will incinerate all the people inside the train. Thank you for watching.